Hey everybody, this is AP Macro. We're doing a review of major graphs, and we are focused on the money market. Guys, the model in this video that we're talking about is the money market, and it's right there. But I want you to know right at the beginning of this video, there's another name for this model right here. It is the liquidity preference model. This name is used a little less often than the money market. Again, AP Macro knows that graph is the money market. But I want to talk about this name just for a second right here at the beginning of this video because it's going to help us understand that graph better. The liquidity preference model. So what people are saying this model is doing is showing our preference for holding our wealth in liquid form. Now when we say holding our wealth in liquid form, we're meaning holding our wealth as money, i.e. currency or in our or holding our wealth in our checking account, right? So what we've got in our checking account and currency, that makes up our liquid assets. Why are they liquid? Because those assets can buy goods and services right now. So again, when we say the liquidity preference model, it's our preference for holding our wealth as money in liquid form. Now, of course, we there are other ways to hold your wealth, right? You can hold it in stocks and bonds and in a savings account in other ways also. Those other ways that we hold our wealth, we do that because they provide a return. However, when we hold our wealth in liquid form, we really don't get a return. Currency, no return at all. Maybe some checking accounts pay a very small rate of interest, but for the most part, conceptually speaking, we should just basically assume checking accounts also don't pay a return, right? And so there is a cost, an opportunity cost, of holding your wealth in liquid form, i.e. as currency, and in your checking account, and that is the nominal interest rate. So, when you hold your wealth in liquid form, you're giving up the nominal interest rate because you are giving up both the real interest rate and the inflation premium. So again, how are we going to hold our wealth? Of course, we're going to hold some of our wealth as money because we've got to buy goods and services. But we don't want all of our wealth in money because we don't want to give up that return. So if that's what this model is also showing us, is this preference to hold our wealth in liquid form, the liquidity preference model. Now, for the rest of the video, I'm going to go back to the name that is used most often, money market, but you're going to see the way I talk about it. I'm going to use a lot of the concepts I just talked about here for us to get understanding. So there it is, the money market. Let's go ahead and label the axes first. Well, we see a market, or we see a graph called the money market. What we're going to put here on the vertical is the price of that thing, right? The price of money. Maybe it'd be best to say the price of holding your wealth as money, right? The cost of holding your wealth as money. And what is that? Well, we've already talked about it. It's the nominal interest rate. Again, when you hold your wealth as money, guys, you are giving up both the real interest rate and the inflation premium. Over here, what are we going to put? Well, it's called the money market, right? We're going to put the quantity of money, and that is perfectly fine. For me, I like to put quantity of M1. Now, guys, M1 is money. Let's be very clear, right? This is an aggregate measurement of the money supply. It's the narrowest measurement of the money supply. And what it includes are truly liquid assets, truly those things that are money, i.e. currency, and what you've got in your checking account. So quantity of M1 is the same thing as saying quantity of money. Now, I've already got a curve on my graph. And I've got this funky curve. It's got this kink. It's going to help us understand what this curve is all about. Now, what is it? Well, it's downward sloping, so you're probably going to guess it's the money demand curve. The way I draw the money demand curve is a conceptual way. I'm going to let you know right off the top, guys, if you just draw it downward sloping, you're going to be okay. But I like to put this little kink in it because it helps me understand that money demand is made up of two components of money demand. And what are those two components? One is transaction demand for money. And that's what this horizontal distance is right here. That's our transaction demand for money. I'm going to explain that in a second. And then another component, which we add on to the transaction demand for money, known as the asset demand for money. Let's first talk about the transaction demand for money. This is our demand for money, demand for holding our wealth in liquid form to do basic transactions, i.e. pay our rent or our mortgage, pay our utility bill, pay our insurance, buy goods and buy uh, groceries, right? So it's to buy those basic goods and services we have to buy. That's our transaction demand for money. One more time, this is our demand for money to do basic transactions, okay? Now, what you'll see is that component of money demand is vertical, okay? And what that means is it is not dependent on the nominal interest rate. I don't look at what the nominal interest rate is to see if I'm going to pay my rent. I just pay my rent. I don't look at the nominal interest rate to buy my basic groceries. I just buy my basic groceries, right? So this portion of money demand is not sensitive to the nominal interest rate. Again, it is known as the transaction demand for money. 
I'm not done talking about it because I need to talk about what's going to change that, but I'll do that in just a little bit. So I want to talk about this other aspect of our money demand, this other component of our money demand, and that is our asset demand for money. This is our demand for the asset money above and beyond our demand for the asset money to do basic transactions. Let me say that one more time. This is our demand um, for the asset money above and beyond our demand for the asset money to do basic transactions, right? This is added on to our transaction demand. So you could think of it like the transaction demand, I could just draw it straight down, right? That's our transaction demand for money. Now, let's say at a nominal interest rate of 8%, if I do a little dash right here, we still have that demand for money to do basic transactions, but now we've got a little bit more. We want to actually hold more of our wealth in liquid form than just enough to do our basic transactions. Well, why is that, guys? Well, think about it. What the currency you hold is not just to do those basic transactions out there. I mean, put it this way. In the next week, I'm not sure if I have anything I'm planning on using cash for, currency for, right, to make payment. However, I want some currency in my wallet, right? So I hold a little extra currency in my wallet. Same with my checking account. I don't just put it up just to cover my basic transactions. I want a little cushion for convenience sake, right? That's the asset demand for money. Now, of course, what's key about the asset demand for money is this downward slope. It is sensitive to the nominal interest rate, right? If you're just holding it for convenience sake, right, on top of your transaction demand for money, it's definitely, you're gonna be, um, you're going to acknowledge the cost of doing that, and that is the nominal interest rate. And it's downward sloping, showing an inverse relationship. Nominal interest rate goes up, right? We're going to hold less of our, uh, of our wealth in liquid form, right? Because this asset demand being sensitive to the nominal interest rate. Nominal interest rate goes down. Hey, the cost of holding your wealth in liquid form is going down. You're going to now hold more of your wealth in liquid form. So again... I like to draw the money demand with this kink to be very explicit that there are two components of money demand. Transaction demand for money, our demand for money to do basic transactions, and asset demand for money. Our demand for money above and beyond our demand for money to do basic transactions. For convenience sake, right? For a little bit of cushion. Alright, so that's the money demand curve. I'm not quite done with it because i got to get back to what's going to shift this curve. But before I do that, let's put that money supply curve on the graph. So how are we going to draw the money supply curve? Very, very important. The money supply curve is vertical. Now, why is it vertical? Maybe instead of saying why it's vertical, maybe I should just say what does it mean when it's vertical? And that's something I've already touched on, right? If you see a vertical line, what this means is it is not sensitive to this variable. It is not changing with this variable. This variable can go up and down, and it's not changing. That's what a vertical line means. The money supply is not sensitive to the nominal interest rate. Why? Because who is determining the money supply? The central bank of a country. In the United States, that would be the Fed. So I like to do the following. Of course, what I'm about to do, you don't have to do when you draw a graph, but I like to always put a little dash, 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 and put Fed, the U.S. Central Bank, reminding me it is the Fed that is controlling this and not the nominal interest rate. So there we go. We've got our two curves. Final thing that we need to talk about is what's going to cause these curves to shift, right? Any market, you want to know what's going to cause the curves to shift. Let's keep going with the money supply because it's pretty straightforward. In fact, we already know the answer. It's the Fed, right? The Fed is what's going to cause that curve to shift. Now, there's three tools of the Fed. There's open market operations, the discount rate, and required reserve ratio. So when the Fed manipulates those tools, guys, the money supply is going to shift. So that's what you're looking for in a problem. If you have the Fed manipulating one of those three tools that I just listed, hey, that MS is going to move. Now, you, of course, got to know what, what, how they're manipulating those tools and which way to shift it. If we're in a recession, what the Fed would probably do, what the problem what we'd suggest the Fed doing nor in normal times, if there's a recession, is we want them to stimulate the economy, increase the money supply. So they would do open market purchases, lower the discount rate, or lower the required reserve ratio, or do all three of them. It doesn't really matter. Do one of those, do all three. That would get the money supply to go to the right. And when we shift the money supply to the right, what's going to happen? Well, that nominal interest rate is going to go down. And when that nominal interest rate goes down, you can see we're going to start holding 
more of our wealth in liquid form, more of our wealth as money, which is what the Fed wants, right? We're in a recession, the Fed wants us to spend more. They're hoping we hold more of our wealth in liquid form because they're hoping money burns a hole in our pocket, right? That we go and buy things, that's what they really want. Now, of course, the same goes, or, or the opposite is true, if we're in like a um, boom time, it's an inflationary gap. We have an inflationary gap, what's the Fed gonna do? They're gonna want to contract the money supply, do tight monetary policy, right? They're gonna do open market sales or raise the required reserve ratio or raise the discount rate. So they will shift this, this direction, getting that nominal interest rate to go up, increasing the cost of holding your wealth as money so that you will hold less of it, right? I'll go in that direction, which means left, so the quantity of money I demand is decreasing, right? So that's what's going to shift the money supply curve. It's straightforward. It's the Fed. And I have to tell you, when you're asked to draw the money market, probably 60 to 80% of the time, it's because of a Fed action. But there is this other reason we might have to draw a money market, and there is other ways that we might get a shift in a curve, right? The money demand shifts for different reasons. The first thing I want you to know is the Fed does not shift the money demand. Let's keep that clear, right? The Fed does not shift this, it shifts the money supply. But money demand can shift. And why would the money demand shift? Well, let's go back to that transaction demand for money. There's two things that determine our transaction demand for money. First is the price level, okay? And this should be obvious, guys. If the prices of the things we're buying goes up, we're gonna need more money to do basic transactions. And the other thing is national income in a country. Now, underneath national income, I'm gonna draw, I'm gonna write something that's pretty much synonymous with national income, and that's real GDP, okay? So as we study macroeconomics, we should know that we use these terms somewhat interchangeably. Why is that? Because the value of what you produce, that's real GDP, determines national income, okay? So, price level and then this. Those are the two things that are determining our transaction demand for money. So, if you get a question where the price level goes up, so you get an increase in price level, what's gonna happen to the nominal interest rate? We don't get anxiety, that's not hard. We're like, okay, price level goes up, let's get a nominal interest rate. Hey, I need to go use that money market. I've got a nominal interest rate right here. Price level increases. Hey, that transaction demand for money is going to move to the right, right? So I'm gonna grab this little handle, I'm gonna shift to the right. And when I shift the transaction demand for money to the right, of course, the asset demand for money goes with it. So we will intersect the money supply at a higher point, nominal interest rate goes up. Hopefully that makes sense to you. Increase the price level, nominal interest rate's gonna go up. If you're told that maybe national income goes down in the country, grab that little handle, shift it left, so transaction demand is decreasing, asset demand is therefore going to go with the transaction demand, we're gonna intersect the money supply at a lower point, nominal interest rate is gonna go down. Now there's a couple other things that might be talked about and what shifts these curves, okay? One is credit card usage. If we start using more credit cards, we're gonna need less money. I know that's a little bit confusing, but credit cards, guys, is a line of credit, it's not money, okay? If we start using more credit cards, we're gonna need less money, okay? We're gonna use less money, we're gonna need less money. We're gonna to have to pay our credit card bill, but remember, we're not gonna really need it for cushion's sake. We're gonna have credit cards for that cushion, for that convenience a lot of time. So what's gonna to happen to the money demand curve when that happens? It's gonna shift left. So again, increase use in credit cards, money demand is gonna shift left. Another final thing you might see on a test is something about uh, technology changes where there's more ATM machines and things like that. Well, if it's easier to get money because there's more ATM machines, we're gonna to need to hold less money for cushion, right? Like I said, for convenience sake. So technology progressing, getting more ATMs out there, we're gonna need less money. Again, money demand shifting to the left. So here we go. Five things I talked about shifting those curves, okay? Only one thing shifts the money supply. I talked about four things shifting money demand. What shifts the money supply? The Fed, and guys, that is the most important thing you know. Know that those three tools of the Fed shift the money supply. What shifts money demand? Okay, the first thing, price level. The next thing is national income or real GDP. Okay, again, that's national income, real GDP. Next, credit card usage, and finally, technological change. Anyhow, hope that you followed all of that, guys. That's the money market, otherwise known as the liquidity preference model. We'll see you in the next video.